Good afternoon, General. Well, thank you very much for joining us uh, on such a beautiful day. Um, on the background, we have some noise, and the reason for that being that Gouda exists for se at least has city rights for 750 years now. So they are playing a beach volleyball outside. Um, it's better to be outside than inside, um, but not for now. Again, w uh, uh, General, very welcome, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, it's a great honor for our students. Uh, our students are sitting on the first row. As was shared with you by Harry, uh, by Mendeville's head, uh, Harry Veenendaal, uh, complexity and uncertainty are lectured in different ways throughout the year. The students reside in the heart of Gouda. It is this topic which we assume is always on the mind of a general. The way in which you have excelled in dealing with an insurgency nearing civil war in Iraq in 2007 and 2008 is a profound example on how an almost hopelessly complex and uncertain situation can be turned around. The search, as we have become to know it, has saved the society of Iraq from disaster. The first half of this hour will be an interview by me, and the next half will be a Q&A from our students and other participants. Uh, and hopefully I have enough questions. It is for me the first time. I think I know you. I saw you last night on CNN, but uh, you do not know me, and maybe that's good for now. Um, <laughs> the, stu <laughs> the students have prepared themselves, or should have prepared themselves, by reading the fourth star. Did you read that book, General? I did read that book. And what, what were your thoughts about it? Was it a, a good... Well, was it as it is, or...? Well, I thought it was a reasonable... Uh, capturing of the subjects of the book, including me. <laughs> well, for them to judge if they finish the book in the summer holidays. Um, of course, we'd like to start with your Dutch heritage. Uh, you are in the heart of Holland. Of course, we love the Frisians. Um, how do you look at the Netherlands? Well, with considerable affection. Uh, in my home growing up, again, for the audience, my dad was a Dutch merchant marine officer. He went to the Merchant Marine Academy in Rotterdam. He grew up in, in Friesland, uh, certainly, and back in the days when the ice was firm enough that you could s skate to all the different cities on that epic uh, skating voyage every year. Um, and he was at sea with his uh, fellow sailors when the Nazis overran Holland in 1940. They couldn't go home, uh, so they went up to New York Harbor, uh, turned into the harbor, and then turned into the Brooklyn Navy Yard and uh, tied up there and asked if they needed sailors. And of course, the United States was desperate for merchant uh, mariners. And so they all signed on with the U.S. Merchant Marine, which is one of our military services during World War II. It's not normally, but during the war it, it was. It had the highest per capita loss rate of any service in the United States military because of the U-boats and so forth that were sinking the merchant ships as they were trying to go back and forth to Europe and ultimately uh, all the way to Murmansk, Russia, so up north of uh, Sweden and Finland. Um, he met my mother there. She was doing her duty as a woman in the United States during the war, uh, lived in Brooklyn and was uh, helping them at the Siemens Institute or something like that. And, you know, I was raised, um, you know, by somebody who was a blunt, uh, blunt, yeah. determined, um, uh, someone who didn't leave something left unsaid, uh, former Dutch sea captain. He, he ultimately, he was, he had, he was a captain of a Liberty ship during World War II at the age of 29, uh, survived a harrowing, uh, convoy to Murmansk in which half the ships in the entire convoy were sunk. Um, so he survived the war um, and we grew up in the banks of a river named for another great Dutchman, Henry Hudson, who sailed past our little town <clears throat> where the town would be and said a nice place to put a town on. Huh. Um, and that's where it is. And we always had sailboats growing up, multiple. I had my own sailboat and it was not a little one that, you know, you just sort of, if you turn it over, you flip it back around. If you turned it over, and I did, uh, you towed it in upside down uh, and then put slings on it. And, you know, and a crane had to pull it out of the water. A very embarrassing moment for me and also for my father, who was 
nickname Cap, Captain, uh, short for Captain uh, there in our yacht club. But again, there was an, there was an awful lot of goodness that came out of that. Uh, there was a sort of a no excuses approach to life. Um, again, Dutch can be fairly blunt. Um, and I love that aspect of it. They're very, you know, they will not mince words. Um, if I came home with something that was less than, you know, what it should have been, he'd just sort of look at me and say, results, boy. Uh, and there's something to be said for that. Uh, at the same time, I mean, they were very, very wonderful parents when it came to imparting uh, knowledge. And we'd go to historic sites uh, every summer and I'd be dragged around to another uh, different location or when I, all I wanted to do was hang out by the motel swimming pool or something. But uh, they were very devoted. Uh, they were wonderful parents. Um, and so I was fortunate to have this wonderful upbringing. And, and again, when we spoke of the old country uh, in our home, uh, it was not the way that Secretary Rumsfeld spoke of old Europe as if it was an anachronism. Um, we spoke of it with great affection. Uh, I've been to the Netherlands many, many times. I was actually, I have a knight, knighthood or whatever the equivalent of a knighthood from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Um, I must tell you, I have never actually worn it. Uh, I've been to a lot of events. There are a lot of Dutch American events in different cities in the United States, and I've received awards from many of those different cities. Uh, and they're often black tie. And I will always take this thing. It's a huge sash with a massive star. It's very, very gaudy. It's very un, un Dutch. Um, and so I, draw I, will, attention, eh? I will put it, I'll put it all on. Uh, I'll look in the mirror and I'll say, no self-respecting Dutchman would ever kid himself out like this. I take it and I put it back in the suitcase. And so I've never actually worn it. Um, but again, I have enormous affection uh, for the Dutch. I was privileged to serve with Dutch forces uh, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, in Iraq, in, in Afghanistan. Um, as some of you will recall, a very close friend of mine, your chief of general staff or defense staff lost his son. Uh, in, in a Rusgun province. Uh, I think I was the four star with the theater commander of US forces at that time, not the commander on the ground in Afghanistan, but um, but the Dutch punch way, way above their weight class uh, and not just in Olympic skating or cycling or these kinds of things. Um, I think in many, many other respects as well. And I have great uh, admiration uh, for the qualities uh, of the Dutch. I know, um, your prime minister very well, Mark Rutte. Um, I see him at, there's an international conference at least once a year, I will see him and he sits through the whole thing. He's, there's no airs about him. He's not the head of a government the way others would be. Um, I mean, he is a head of a government. He just doesn't have the kind of um, uh, approach that many others would have. So look, there's an awful lot of goodness uh, in, in the Netherlands, in your society, uh, in your approach to life, in your um, the way that you prize education. And I mean, this academy is a manifestation of that. Um, Thank you. you saw a need for something that wasn't met. Uh, you decided to fill it um, in like typical Dutch, you know, you stubbornly stuck to your task and, uh, and, and have seen it through. And you provided this great opportunity uh, for students um, who are quite exceptional. Yeah. And although otherwise might not find that exceptional uh, capability, uh, that, that same opportunity uh, to express or to pursue that exceptional capability. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your kind words. What is the name of your dog? Freya. Freya. It's actually, it's a, it's a <laughs> Norse, it's a Norse. Yeah. Yeah, it was, she was our son's dog. Um, and then he, he, our son served in the military, I should note, he was actually a rifle platoon leader, a second lieutenant uh, in combat when I would, when I took over command in Afghanistan. He did multiple additional tours there with uh, the Ranger Forces Special Operations. Um, he finished the JD MBA, he went to MIT, he was a brilliant uh, student, would qualify for the Mandeville Academy easily. Okay, uh, well, he's welcome. He did a JD MBA at Harvard and now he's a, a lawyer in in New York and married to a fellow Afghan veteran who where they also, and by the way, her father is a Dutch fighter pilot um, who met her mother in Texas, which is where an awful lot of the Dutch actually fly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is the, the, the airspace is a lot less congested than it is over uh, Northern Europe. Yeah. 
true. And he went uh, settled there, um, and they, you know, they they produced a daughter who went to Harvard and a Rhodes Scholar, and also served in Afghanistan on her second startup, I might add. Okay, so that's um, uh, enough Dutch ties, so to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's oh, I forgot I forgot that yeah. other quality: thrifty and frugal. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 the students might say tight, actually. Tight. Well, they've changed, I guess, in the past year, hopefully, and for, and for the better. Um, 75 years of superpower. Um, our students are born after 9-11. Um, it's a generation which is not fully aware of the role of the United States played in the liberation of Europe. My generation is, has grown up with that situation. Mm -hmm. um, United States now the only remaining superpower and criticized by many. But could you provide a sketch to our, to our students on how they should look at the role of the United States since 9-11? In five well, minutes, it, Max, General. Sure. Um, obviously, 9-11 was the worst attack on American soil in our history by far, nearly 3,000. Uh, Americans and others, I'm sure there were Dutch Dutch in the uh, Twin Towers. Uh, just about every country in the world had someone there. Um, the response uh, was to ask the country in which the Al-Qaeda elements, the Islamist extremists, planned the attacks where the sanctuary was. That was, of course, in eastern Afghanistan. The Taliban regime, which ruled the country at the time, uh, wouldn't take any action, so we went in and eliminated the sanctuary, but of course, to do that, we also had to eliminate the Taliban regime. Uh, that touched off a period of two decades of uh, what started out as counter-terrorism operations led to a need for counter-insurgency operations. Uh, there were activities along the way that we look back on and uh, recognize uh, should not have been done. Uh, some of the treatment of admittedly extremists, in some cases, very, very seriously evil terrorists. But even in those cases, uh, you should observe the law of land warfare and the Geneva Convention. I feel very strongly about that. I also recognize I've also been in charge of more detainees in mm -hmm. recent American history than anyone else. And uh, we know that it actually doesn't work. If you really want to get information from a detainee, become his best friend. Uh, that takes time, it takes relationship building, it takes really skilled interrogators, but it actually can be done. And if you want useful, solid information, that's the way you go about it. Um, Afghanistan is often viewed as the war of necessity. Uh, candidate Obama, then President Obama, referred to Iraq as the war of choice. Um, folks can debate uh, endlessly whether we should or should not have done that. The only question of any uh, that I will not answer is that one, uh, because I wrote more letters of condolence to America's mothers and fathers and any other uh, commander over the years. I spent four years of my life there as a two-star, three-star, and four-star commander, ultimately commanding the surge, as you noted. Um, again, we were, there are mistakes made in war. I think it's very, very important uh, not just in war, but in any situation, really, for leaders to acknowledge when mistakes have been made, either by that they made themselves or members of their organizations did. You then try to determine precisely what happened, why it happened, and what you should learn from it, and how to mitigate the risks of it happening again. Uh, I do believe very strongly that America is a force for good in the world, uh, but we are far from perfect. Um, we don't even always observe all of our own values and all that we do at home. Um, again, we have a uh, history, some of which is painful. Uh, keep in mind that um, our country had such differences um, that a little less than 100 years into our existence, we had a horrible civil war, um, Americans fighting fellow Americans, in some cases, brothers fighting brothers. Um, and even in the wake of that, it took another uh, century or more before some of the vestiges of um, 
ultimately of slavery and, and so forth were, were truly eliminated. And, and I wouldn't argue that all of that has been eliminated yet. Again, I strongly believe that democracy uh, is the best, or democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others, uh, yeah. as I think Churchill used to say. I also believe, as Churchill used to say as well, that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they try all the wrong things or all the other things. Uh, but I believe very strongly in my economy or my country, but I also recognize that we have some enormous challenges, not just abroad right now, um, where you see the most complex array of challenges I think we've seen since the end of World War II. I think we also have the most significant challenges at home, um, at least in many decades. Uh, and that's very worrisome. And we see those challenges in other democracies around the world. Um, interesting, the Netherlands seems to be able to navigate through these, but you have obviously had your own challenges with folks on the extreme end of the right wing and also obviously some challenges uh, from uh, the other side of the spectrum, as all democracies do over time. But on a the much smaller scale, uh, yeah, indeed, on, on a much, much more uh, smaller scale than that. But we will be getting there to the to the, the situation in Iraq and Afghanistan. We first like to return to your career. Um, uh, although you were best known for your role in the search in 2007, not many people know your tour as a divisional commander of the 101st Airborne for the Cobra II, um, uh, inv it was called Cobra II, eh, the invasion of uh, Iraq, I remember correctly. It was. Cobra I was in 44 in June with Patton, by the way. You should remember that. Uh, a few weeks ago... Uh, well, I'm, very I'm very proud to, you know, the, the role that the 100... I had two divisions in my life, if you will, for most of my life. The 82nd Airborne Division, where I commanded a brigade, and was the assistant division commander of the 101st Airborne Division, where I commanded a battalion, was the division chief of operations, plans, and training, and ultimately was the division commander. These two divisions, uh, their heritage includes, uh, of course, jumping into Holland yep. uh, in the Operation Market Garden, which came known also as the Bridge Too Far, um, and respectively seized Eindhoven, the 101st, and then uh, the 82nd Nijmegen. Uh, for the 82nd Airborne Division, there was the historic crossing of the Wall River. The regiment that I commanded, the brigade in the 82nd, was the unit that did that crossing of the Wall River. In fact, actually, I won't move it all around in here, but somewhere in the background here, actually, it's around the corner, there is a beautiful painting of the crossing of the Wall River by the soldiers of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. I was really privileged to go I think it was the 70th anniversary of that operation when I was a four-star general and to represent the United States and to do a variety of events. Um, there's a famous torchlight parade that takes place in Eindhoven to replicate or to commemorate this. And then also there was a crossing of the Wall River. The queen uh, was actually uh, at that then, at that time, the, the queen. Um, and uh, again, a really, really wonderful set of, uh, of events. Oh, and oh, one that I, will, I, I want to share with you is that we went to one of the cemeteries and every grave in that cemetery was adopted by a Dutch family uh, and very carefully groomed. And on these special occasions, uh, they all had flowers and other um, items of respect to those who gave the last full measure of devotion as Abraham Lincoln termed dying for your country. Yeah. You, you might know that in the Netherlands we're still discussing what happened at Market Garden and if uh, it was a good decision um, uh, to go there or try to come through Arnhem. I assume you studied that operation or at least uh, no, not, not of course. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what your opinion is on that? Was it a good decision? Well, it was a very risky decision, frankly. Um, as you will know from having studied it, the intelligence was flawed. Um, and so they didn't realize the presence of a fairly substantial German uh, enemy unit. And then, of course, the armored forces moved much more slowly than was expected uh, to link up with Arnhem. Uh, so I, I should also note that I had relatives in Arnhem 
uh, during World War II. Um, and they talked about how, you know, one moment they were liberated by the British paratroopers, and I think also Polish were with them. And then the next moment, the British and Polish realized they were going to have to try to get across the river to link back up with friendly forces because they couldn't withstand the attacks. I was there when the there's a, a famous house there where there's an airborne museum. And I was actually there that the, the very weekend that it was open. Uh, I remember visiting there and it was a really special moment. Thank you. I was uh, telling you, well, I was telling the, the audience about the fact that you um, commanded the one of the first airborne. Um, and after the invasion, you were relocated to Mosul. Uh, two weeks ago, we've had a conference at Mandeville Academy with uh, an Iraqi person, uh, and I, we can share the story later. But the first time I spoke to him, I, I asked him, how was the situation in 2003, 2004, when the 101st was in Mosul? And he said it was a very good situation. So by this, his compliment to you from me, uh, he was very happy when you were there, but we all know what happened after uh, you left. In yeah, the insurgency report. got much worse. Um, yeah. You know, we, I sort of had, in a way had studied these situations my entire life and I wasn't unprepared for what we had to do. And it didn't matter to me that nobody from above me gave me any guidance. We just went ahead and decided okay. what we needed to do. And so we ran the first election in all of Iraq. We had the first provincial council. Mosul is the capital of Nineveh, the biblical Nineveh or what have you. Um, and so we had a provincial council, we had a governor, uh, we had flights coming in. We, we were doing investment banking deals to refurbish the two hotels. We actually did do deals. Uh, we you reopened an international board. Too, huh? um, I mean, again, it was a very, very good period. They named a street after us when we left. By the way, was that Omar, Mohammed Omar? Who, no, it is from uh, uh, Basim Razo. Oh, okay, different. But I'll, I'll tell you more about him later. Um, you were prepared for the phase four, or at least the possibility of a counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. But was there no guidance or no word before that what would happen if the war would have been won? Was there nothing after that? Not even when it was you very little. preparing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting anecdote that when we were still in Kuwait um, preparing for the invasion, there was one final gathering of all the division commanders. We were already all out in the desert floor of Kuwait, you know, at least an hour, hour and a half uh, or more drive if you had to do it uh, through the desert. So we all flew in on helicopters. <clears throat> My division had 254 helicopters just to give you a sense of how capable this organization was and about 20,000 troops. And I remember we went in there and there were a couple of three stars that were our bosses. And then there were some retired three stars actually who were what were in charge of what was called the Organization for Reconstruction Humanitarian Assistance. This was the organization that was going to take over. Um, and so, you know, they gave a little pep talk and everything else and um, said, okay, anybody got any questions? And I raised my hand and I said, excuse me, um, but could you just give a little more detail uh, about what happens? You know, we get to Baghdad, we topple the regime. Um, can you give me a little bit more uh, on what takes place then? And this retired three star who, who knew me, in fact, he commanded the 82nd Airborne Division. He turned to me and he said, Dave, you just get us to Baghdad. We'll take it from there. And so I remember we actually got to an intermediate city, Najaf, the holiest city in Shia Islam. We took it. We were the first division to actually take a city. This is about five or 600,000 people. Pretty tough fight, all three brigades engaged and all that stuff. And I called up my boss, a three-star, and I said, hey, I've got good news and bad news. He said, what's the good news? I said, well, we we own Najaf. What's the bad news? We own Najaf. What do you want us to do with this thing? Um, you know, we want to get back and fight to Baghdad. Um, and we had to leave an entire brigade. So he said, call up those guys from Orha. So I called them up and they were still getting organized down there. The bottom line is that we really hadn't thought that through, at least realistically. What was presented to us was being invalidated literally while we were still on the road to Baghdad. Um, it was pretty clear that we weren't just going to be able to topple the Saddam Hussein, this horrible, murderous, kleptocratic regime. Uh, and then bring in others who take over and everything remains intact and we just go home to a victory parade. 
it was starting to be pretty clear that there were going to be a lot of other challenges. I'd been very fortunate to have served in Central America uh, for a summer, admittedly, but why I observed the counterinsurgency campaign in El Salvador and also in Colombia and Peru. Um, I served in Haiti. I was a UN officer, not a US officer. I was the chief of operations for the United Nations force there. And we did a tremendous amount of nation building there when uh, the regime was toppled, as you may recall, in 1995. Uh, 94 and 95. And then I'd served for a year in Bosnia, which was very much a peacekeeping operation with, with a very comprehensive um, multi-year roadmap, it was called. But it enjoyed all of the civilian entities that you would love to have in this. We had a UN mission. We had an uh, a EU high representative was the political figure. We had a variety of other uh, OSCE, and they all had different tasks uh, that would be performed not normally by the military. Uh, but when we ended up in Mosul, uh, we had no civilian entities, we had no political leadership, we had nothing to be, and I, under the Geneva Convention, uh, a commander in my position is the executive, judicial, and legislative all in one. And, you know, there's an old army adage, when in, when in charge, take charge. Uh, and I took charge and we took the multi-year roadmap. We adapted it, except that we had to do everything rather than civilian entities. Um, and we just got on with it. I'd also been fortunate to have taught economics and international relations and new political concepts and theories and so forth. And so that gave us some, all you need is the basics. You just need to get the big ideas right and then try to figure out how to operationalize them in that context. Yeah. We actually, yeah. it, that was an enjoyable period and had then the replacement for Orha not come in, then the coalition provisional authority, which the first act was to fire the Iraqi army and then to fire the party of Saddam Hussein. But that party went throughout the entire society. So when you fire these two entities, what you have, first of all, are hundreds of thousands of people who are angry and whose um, incentive is to undermine or to fight the new Iraq rather than to support it. Um, and, and second, you have people with actual military training and weapons uh, who are going to make life very difficult for you. And so we literally spent probably the next four years until the surge in Iraq, when when I was the commander, um, in certain areas, there was not even a real Iraqi government presence. So I was Baghdad at that point in time, and we could finally reconcile with people some of whom had our blood on their hands, but that was a crucial element. It, one of the big ideas that galvanized the surge was that you cannot kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. You have to reconcile with as many as you can. That's how you end these things. Do you think that there would have not been insurgency if the army would have remained in place and the Ba'ath party, well, of course, would be banned, but the, all the clerks would have, have, have remained in place? It would have been very, very different. I'm sure there still would have been some opposition uh, and it still would have been very, very challenging because you bring in, you know, you basically taken the organizing uh, entity out and now it is largely, uh, again, decapitated um, and you have everyone squabbling over power. And of course, the regime that was toppled was a Sunni Arab regime in a Shia Arab majority country. So you're going to have a transition of power from Sunni to Shia at the very top in any case. And that was going to be very, very difficult. And of course, if we wanted to have democracy, and again, we don't think that democracy should just be limited to those in Europe and North America and so forth. Um, but that's a very difficult task to go from, again, a brutal uh, autocratic uh, system such as Saddam established, which is also a command economy. So there was very, very little true capitalism or free enterprise. Yeah. Uh, so to transition very rapidly, there, Bernard Lewis was a great professor at Princeton where I earned my PhD. And he had a saying that democracy is strong medicine in the Middle East. It should be taken small doses at a time. Uh, and I think if folks had remembered that, they would have been wise as we were trying to help Iraq get back on its feet. Yeah, it will take some time for this country to be on a democratic track, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, Although, to be clear, it has had five peaceful transfers of power. The current one is a rather extended one because they haven't been able to form a government for about six months since they had the elections. But again, 
generally, uh, the transfer of power has been, and the elections have generally been, been quite free and fair. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm already mindful of my time. I'm not even halfway in my own questions. I'll have to pick some before we go to our students. Um, let me see. Well, what I'm really curious about is um, you studied counterinsurgency early in your career. Um, uh, for the general public, war is still kinetic war, fought by armies on the ground with great mobility from the air and from the sea. What are your thoughts on the next war? What would the next war look like? And we know Ukraine and Russia, but what can we expect to be a next war? Will it be a war fought by people or will it be fought on the internet, for instance? Well, it could be many different uh, manifestations. Um, the fact is that right now around the world, there are numerous wars going on. Some are small, very small. Uh, the response to some of those is the kind of counterinsurgency, civil military comprehensive campaign that we employed in Iraq. Um, it could be against Islamist extremists. There are pockets of those. We should keep forces in Iraq and Syria and various places in Africa, at the very least, just to keep an eye on them, uh, at, at most to help the host nations uh, identify the terrorist elements within the, the extremist elements and so forth. So you have that element that's present. You have what's almost like a, a somewhat updated version of the Cold War breaking out in war. Uh, what we train for, you know, I spent a couple of decades uh, again when Cold War Europe was the focus and that was going to be a conventional combat campaign. Uh, that's really what you see in Ukraine by and large. In fact, it's many of the same systems. Russia, it turns out, did not modernize its force anywhere near the way that they advertised or that they rolled through Red Square on Victory Day. Yeah. In those celebrations, it turns out it's many of the same old, you know, T-62, T-72, T T-80s and so forth, tanks and artillery, still very heavy artillery, still don't have a non-commissioned officer corps, still have a lot of conscripts, etc. So, but you do see what will be the harbingers of the future. And those are uh, unmanned aerial systems. And we don't really see the most capable of those systems in the sky uh, over Ukraine. They may get there. The, the predator may be coming from the United States. Uh, we have even more capable than that now. But the point is that increasingly you're going to have systems that are remotely piloted, remotely operated, or even at some point autonomous. In other words, operating in accordance with algorithms where the human in the loop uh, is the human who builds the algorithm that guides what the system does. And this can be a lethal system. Uh, and then that human in the loop may press a button and say, okay, weapons free if you identify based on your computer vision, uh, your computer analysis of, you know, again, facial, the equivalent of facial recognition for robots or gate recognition or a variety of other signature items uh, if you identify a declared hostile you just pull the trigger um, and so we're going to see increasing uh, elements of this start to make their way into the military forces of the most sophisticated uh, militaries in the world and that certainly is the case in the u.s and other western uh, militaries and we'll see that in in china as well and I think that's the future. And of course, cyberspace is now a new domain of warfare. So even as you are carrying out operations on land, sea and air and in outer space as well, uh, there will also be uh, essentially combat conflict uh, being carried out in cyberspace. Some of that by humans uh, augmented by all kinds of capabilities in that domain. And some of it, again, by autonomous uh, capabilities that are operating in cyberspace. And then the other dimension I think that is quite unique when it comes to Ukraine is that all of this will take place in context where there are there are ubiquitous presence of smartphones which enable you to take videos, photographs, recordings, and then upload them on social media. 
Uh, and with data aggregators that are out there, and I subscribe to one uh, data miner, I think it's called, um, you can actually get a feel, you know, if you, in a sense, marinate in the information that is coming out of Ukraine uh, via smartphones and it also by government and even military organizations, the Ukrainian military units seem to have a competition ongoing for who can have the snazziest video uh, put to music even um, of their greatest hits and their greatest hits are, you know, javelin anti-tank missiles taking out Russian tanks or uh, surface to ground, surface to surface missiles, uh, again, taking out Russian systems, artillery, uh, hitting all of it videoed by drones um, and then downloaded and uploaded on social media with music and editing. Um, you know, that's the way of the future. Um, everything we do will be carried out in that kind of context. And that also means that open source intelligence, as it's described, as opposed to intelligence that we have to steal or get from some uh, source within an adversary's organization, open source intelligence is vastly richer uh, and vastly more informative than it ever has been in the past. Um, and again, that enables you, if you're a sufficiently assiduous and just work hard at it, to have a sense of what really is going on uh, in a war such as in Ukraine in a way that we never could have uh, in the past where we were just depending on, again, periodic uh, news accounts or even just internet uh, uh, provided accounts, this is quite unique. And what, is your, what are your expectations on the developments in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? Is it a prolonged war? Is somebody going to win? Or can't we talk about winning anymore? Well, it depends what, how you define winning, certainly. I, what I do think will happen um, is that Russia is going to try to seize the last few bits of the so-called Donbass, the areas of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts or provinces in the southeast, and then to retain what they've taken north of Crimea in the south, they'll harden the front lines of that. They will run a referendum with the Ukrainian people. Remarkably, that referendum will find that 99.9% .9 of the Ukrainians desperately want to be Russian citizens and would like Russia. They plead with President Putin to uh, annex those areas into the Russian Federation, that will happen. Uh, and then he'll say next move, but that's what they're going to try to do. Um, and by the way, he still has grander visions. He'd still like to take the entire Southern coast, the entire Black Sea access away from Ukraine. He'd like to tie into that sliver of Moldova to the Southwest of Ukraine that is controlled by about a thousand Russian paratroopers left, <coughs> et cetera. Uh, he'd still like to topple the Ukrainian government, something he failed to do uh, in the original battle of Ukraine and replace President Zelensky with a pro-Russian figure. But in the meantime, the Ukrainians are undertaking an enormous force generation process. In other words, where they are uh, getting recruits uh, from their population who are not in uniform. They have hundred or thousand or more of these they're giving them training, they're equipping them. Uh, the US and other countries are providing massive quantities of weapon systems and ammunition and other material and supplies. To look at, we've provided 260,000 rounds of heavy artillery, 155 millimeter artillery and uh, 126 or 28 howitzers. I mean, this is a staggering quantity. I mean, this is, just to <coughs> transport that number of rounds would take at least 6,000 or more trucks. That's just, just for the ammo. And again, you got to have other trucks that haul the, the uh, artillery tubes. You have to have logistics for all of this, fuel, food, water, everything else. It's a massive undertaking to do that. But this is all flowing in. And of course, other countries are providing uh, very substantial amounts in aggregate as well. Um, so as this force generation process really gets into higher gear, uh, I think Ukraine will be able to, to take back some of the terrain. And then the element of this war that lies in the future, uh, I think is going to be essentially an insurgency by Ukrainians in Russian controlled areas. Uh, and they're not very good at counterinsurgency operations where 
you have to be very, very careful not to create more enemy by uh, what you do uh, with each operation. Uh, so I think that the combination of, again, guerrilla, insurgent, partisan warfare in the areas controlled by Russia with Ukrainians trying to hit flanks of Russia, especially from the west to the east down in the southwest, or trying to liberate the city of Kherson, that's K-H-E-R-S-O-N, one of the first cities the Russians were able to take control of in the beginning coming out of Crimea. And then if they can just get into the rear of the Russians and if they can logistically support it, which is not easy, they keep on pushing and keep taking area away from the Russians. Um, that's, I think, how it will shape up, but either side could literally sort of run out of capability and you could have a new frozen conflict with just different front lines from those that uh, were in, in place in the wake of the 2014 Russian operations in the Donbass in the southeastern part of the country. Okay, thank you. Um, students, who wants to ask the first question? I have a microphone somewhere. Oh, I had one. Oh, no, here it is. Is it on? Not, Not all together. together. Oh, Flores. Flores. Right. Yes, well, my name is Flores. Thank you so much for, uh, for the past half an hour. Uh, my first question uh, regards Ukraine as well. And I was wondering, uh, before February, uh, did you ever expect this war to be of this scale? Did you ever expect that this would happen uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine? You know, I think that it's always hard to believe that something might actually take place um, like this. I, I remember sitting in wait on the eve of the invasion of Iraq, and I think you might have to turn off those microphones when they're not in use. I remember even on the eve of the invasion of uh, Iraq that, you know, some sense that Saddam Hussein will all of a sudden wake up and say, this is crazy. The Americans are about to take down my regime and I will do whatever they ask me to do. Um, and again, there was a sense, I think, that Putin at the last minute would draw back having achieved. Because remember that President Zelensky in the final days did offer um, and negotiated settlement that would have been reasonable. Um, it would have made Ukraine neutral, uh, no enemy, no enemy, no foreign forces on their soil. Um, they would have essentially rented Crimea to Russia for a dollar a century or something like that. So they would have codified what Russia already had seized back in 2014. It was not, um, again, beyond the, the realm of the possible. Uh, and yet Putin, in this colossal miscalculation, thought that he was just going to thunder run, as we did in Baghdad in 2003, and just topple the regime uh, that the Ukrainians would fold uh, in the face of the great Russian war ma machine, and they would replace President Zelensky with a pro-Russian Russian figure. Um, I will say that I did, in an interview with the Atlantic magazine here in the United States say that I believe that Russia would never take Kyiv, much less control it. And that did prove true uh, because I have some sense of urban combat and I've been to Ukraine uh, just before the lockdown for COVID uh, after President Zelensky was elected. I went down to the Donbass to the front lines or like World War I trench warfare uh, and then also to Kharkiv and to Kiev and so forth and met with their leaders. And I was very, very impressed with the progress they'd made since 2014 and the professionalization of their military. They'd come enormous distance since that time. And then, of course, once the United States and other countries start providing uh, assistance, um, then you have an incredibly determined force that is uh, supported by the entire country. I mean, the irony of what has happened is that Vladimir Putin set out to make Russia great again. And what he really has done is give the greatest boost imaginable to Ukrainian nationalism. He's made NATO great again. And he's also, frankly, given an opportunity for the Biden administration in the United States to demonstrate that, yes, the U.S. still can lead uh, in situations like this, uh, having not necessarily done that. Uh, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, where I, I pu publicly questioned the decision, said we would come to regret it. I think we have. And also 
believe that we should have true consultation with allies, not just tell them what we're going to do. And then, of course, execute it a heck of a lot better than was done uh, last August. Um, in any event, I think, to be fair, the administration in Washington has been very impressive uh, in the run up to the invasion where they released essentially intelligence products without exposing sources and methods, which is not easy. Um, and have guided the response uh, very effectively and really had prepared in advance uh, many of the financial and economic sanctions that have been imposed, uh, starting with the US, also EU, UK, Japan, and other countries around the world, uh, and carried out a lot of the other actions. And then just this massive quantity of arms, uh, it really is stunning. It's a tsunami of weapon systems going into Ukraine you know, we talked about the United States being the arsenal of democracy in World War II, as European countries were either occupied or under threat, say the case of Great Britain. Um, and it was the war machinery of manufacturing and industry of the United States that sustained uh, Great Britain, has sustained Russia, other countries around the world. In this case, Ukraine is being sustained by the arsenals of democracy with an S on the end of it, because all of the Western world countries are contributing in various ways, albeit the US vastly more than all the others put together. But I mean, that's also in keeping with the NATO alliance where the US doesn't just spend more than all 29 of our allies, we spend more than twice as much as all 29 of our allies put together. Uh, look, <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Luke. Um, my question was, um, what's your view on leadership? What's for you like good leadership? Not like necessarily of a country, just in general, in yeah, in a team or in a group. Sure. Yep. Um, you can actually go to the website of the Belfer Center at Harvard. Um, where I was a fellow for six years. And during that time, it's just a part-time thing um, in my post-government time, but the team and I there put together a whole website. And if you go to the belfercenter.org or what have you, and just Google Petraeus on strategic leadership, this website will pop up. And it identifies the four tasks of leadership, particularly of strategic leadership, but any leaders at any level have to perform these four tasks. And so what is good leadership? It's performing these four tasks uh, impressively, uh, getting the big ideas right, the strategy, uh, the basic direction and so forth, uh, communicating the big ideas throughout the breadth and depth of the organization, uh, also up out to stakeholders, to possible clients, customers, bosses, whatever. Uh, it's overseeing the implementation of the big ideas. That's what we normally think of as leadership. In other words, you know, the example you provide, the energy, the inspiration, the incentivization, the, the hiring of great people, attracting great talent, retaining it, making it feel fulfilled, uh, allowing others to move on to something else. Uh, the metrics, how you spend your time, your battle with them is a crucial element of leadership. We had a huge butcher block piece of paper on which everything I did, you know, every day was on there. Then what we did a couple of times a week, once a week, every other week, monthly, quarterly, et cetera. Um, and we stuck to it and I got exercised if um, we didn't stick to it sufficiently. Although there's constant interruptions and in combat, there are, there's no end of surprises and uh, events that just take you away from what it is that you're trying to do on a given day. Um, and then there's a fourth task that you've got to perform that is often overlooked. And this is the, the way it's normally best done formally with meetings that on your battle with them that, that require you to determine how to refine the big ideas. You need to make changes. You either jettison some of them, you find new big ideas, you adapt the ones that exist, and then you do it again and again and again. And by the way, think about this fourth task when it comes to Kodak, a company that before you were born, perhaps, was the greatest film photography com company in the world. It had 2000 patents on digital photography, but because it failed to adapt the biggest of the big ideas, which was all about film uh, and so forth, they didn't get to digital photography first. Uh, others did, 
and Kodak just doesn't exist in the way that it used to before. They've been in search of new big ideas ever since uh, and haven't really found anything comparable to what they had when they were the greatest film photography company in the world. So again, good leadership gets these four tasks right and keeps getting them right. Uh, and it's a constant process. And it's true, frankly, there are big ideas on life. There's big ideas on, you know, obviously in, in organizations of any type. Um, and life really in general is about getting the big ideas right. The fact is that in the surge in Iraq, the big ideas that we implemented we're 180 degrees different from what we've been doing before. I mean, obviously, it doesn't get any bigger uh, than that kind of basically reversing what it was that we've been intent on doing uh, prior to the surge. And that's a pretty big deal. Um, and thankfully, you know, I had the absolute support of the president of the United States, even if I did not have the support actually of my immediate boss or the the military chiefs of service uh, in the Pentagon because of the way this was draining our forces and requiring everything that we had. And it was a real challenge indeed to the, to the services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, to their ability to sustain themselves. Um, but, you know, my job was to turn around a very, very serious uh, situation that was on the verge of a full-blown Sunni Shia civil war. Um, and that's, that's what we did in the end. Shu, can you ask the follow-up question? I was wondering what kind of ethical challenges you have faced in your leadership and through the steps that you take. Yeah, look, there's no shortage of those. Um, and I think, again, you have to sort of have big ideas here, which is that um, you're going to speak truth to power. Uh, there are ways of doing that. Um, you know, you don't have to have a confrontation every time. There are ways of sort of getting people to do what it is you're trying to get them to do, to do the right thing. I mean, there was something that we used to call uh, preemptive praise. This is one of the techniques that's described in that website. I'm pretty sure we captured it there. And I would, for, just to give you an example of this, I very much wanted the prime minister in Iraq to take a particular action at a certain time. And and it was pretty clear that he was not going to do that because we had all kinds of good sources around him. And I had a lot of interface with him as well. And it was a real hard sell. So I remember going in for our weekly meeting with him on the battle rhythm, you know, one hour a week. Uh, we had many other where we interfaced, but this was specifically just, again, uh, the ambassador and I would go in and we'd take turns being the lead. And on the on as we're going into the room, uh, even before we get conversing, I said, Prime Minister, I just can't tell you how happy I am to hear that you are going to take this particular, I said, no need to say anything. You, you don't need to confirm. I'm just so excited to hear this. And I just went on and on and on until I think he figured, I guess, let's just do this, you know, and the guy is praising me for it. I might as well actually do it. Um, and lo and behold, that actually succeeded. Now, you can't do that often. They'll catch on to that. And but it does take a lot of different types of, of techniques. Um, but no, there are ethical challenges everywhere. Um, our army in Vietnam was not, uh, did not do well in the ethical. Uh, we had body counts that were often inflated. Uh, reporting can be wrong. I think some of the reports from the battlefields in Afghanistan in the final years that we were there were, were overly optimistic. Um, you know, there have been times when I've been accused of over optimism, although I tried really, really hard to learn from uh, those. And when I was a four star, I would say that, you know, we have made progress on the ground. It is indisputable. Here are the numbers. I'll live and die by these numbers. We, you know, if you want to dig into them, I've already got done that, but happy to do that with you. Um, and if they turn around, we'll report them accurately. Um, and I would say, you know, the progress is fragile, but reversible. Uh, they'd asked me, you know, are we winning or losing? I said, I don't even use those terms. We are making progress uh, at this point in time. Um, we will try to do everything we can. You know, again, it was just very, very measured uh, to where you couldn't be challenged uh, of trying to paint a happy face or something like that. I would be asked even, you know, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I'd say I'm neither. I am a realist. And reality is that 
a rock is all hard all the time, um, that kind of stuff. So again, I think you have to be keenly aware and, you know, in the military and uniform in particular, but I think in most, um, most of us, you know, we're can do kinds of people. I mean, you didn't get into the front row there because you are, uh, because you're not can do. I mean, you're all about can do, you want to do stuff. And so in certain circumstances, it's really hard if you've been in charge of something for a year, uh, at the end of that to assess that, well, yeah, we didn't make any difference, you know, or it's going backwards or so again, I mean, there are challenges everywhere. Um, and you've got to be very, very careful with them. Uh, and, you know, by no means is my career perfect in that regard. And, you know, there are things that you, where you make mistakes or individuals make mistakes in your organization. And as I mentioned earlier, you've got to sit down and determine what happened, identify the reasons for it, uh, figure out what to learn from it, and then determine what changes need to be made so you can reduce the risks of it happening again. Heb jij de microfoon voor uh, Chris? Yeah. Ik, I've got two more questions oh, from one oh, online yeah. person and one That's over okay. here. Yeah. Is there time for that now? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Petraeus. I'm off camera, but I'm, uh, we have some people that are watching the lecture online. And one of them is uh, Asmat Khan. Uh, two weeks ago, she gave a lecture here and she sent us a question. So I'm going to read it to you. Uh, her question is, the New York Times won the 2022 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for revealing the hidden casualties in thousands of American military airstrikes in America's war in Iraq, Afghanistan and Syria. Our reporting revealed, or the New York Times reporting revealed, significant gaps in the claims of intelligence made by the US military and the reality on the ground. Uh, specifically of a failure to detect civilians, to investigate on the ground, to identify causes and lessons learned to discipline anyone or find wrongdoing that would prevent these recurring problems from happening again. Recently, the Department of Defense spokesperson called the reporting important and acknowledged that uh, we knew we weren't always as transparent about those mistakes as we should be and that reporting made us ask ourselves some new and difficult questions of our own, even as it forced us to answer their difficult questions. What are your own thoughts about grappling with this legacy? Well, let me just say what it was that we tried to do when I was privileged to command in Iraq and Afghanistan and the greater Middle East, US Central Command and so forth. Um, we actually tried very hard to be transparent. I was the one who insisted that we would open every detention facility to the Red Cross, um, including the one that was run by our special mission unit, by our counterterrorist task force. Uh, that was not hugely popular with everyone, um, and yet that is what we did. We had embedded reporters all the time. I mean, it's, that's how I got this question, tell me how this ends, recorded, because I had a three-time Pulitzer Prize winning Rick Atkinson uh, riding in my helicopter and Humvee and so forth. And, you know, as it was clear to me, as I mentioned earlier, that things weren't going to turn out the way we've been told they were going to turn out, I started asking, tell me how this ends. Uh, and I was asked that question by many congressional committees uh, after that over the years until I actually showed them how it might end. Um, we also always in my command posts in the operations centers had a sign on the wall that asked a question will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? And if the answer to that was uh, no, in other words, it, it will create more bad guys than it takes off the street. You're supposed to go sit under a tree until the thought passes. In other words, you don't conduct the operation. And it sounds to me as if these, uh, the operations in which the New York Times reported violated that again that's a that is a huge mistake again these these are wars of the people um and you're trying to persuade the people to support you instead of supporting extremists or insurgents uh and ultimately to support the host nation that you're supporting um we might be a halfway house to that support for the host nation so again it's hugely important uh, this is the essence that i mentioned earlier that there were actions that we took waterboarding for example um is not something that I felt was was proper. And I 
stated that uh, when I was in the confirmation hearing for being director of the CIA. When I was a commander and we had detainees early on in the beginning where no one was giving us any guidance, we sat around and we talked about this, you know, what should we do? And we finally said, you know what, the Geneva Convention, we've studied this all our careers uh, in the law of land warfare. It's a required subject every year. You have to go back and uh, go through that. Why don't we just practice that? Yes, these are not, I know it's not a declared war and these are not declared prisoners of war. There are some legal terms uh, for that. Uh, but why don't we just follow that? And if everyone had followed that, we wouldn't have uh, sustained some of the uh, criticism, uh, legitimate criticism of some of our actions and some of our detention facilities. So again, I think the, the key is you, know, you want to be both legal and it can be international law or domestic law or what have you, and also to pass the front page of the Washington Post test. Uh, in other words, um, will the American public look at this and say, yes, we're proud that our men and women in uniform are doing this or no, they'll be ashamed about it. Um, and I think the, the case that's reported there is one where there was expediency and saying that it's an imminent threat and that was used again and again and again to override the normal rules of engagement. Um, and again, when that becomes a practice, you can end up with problems such as those that were reported, uh, which is why the Pentagon said, yeah, we got to take a very, very hard uh, look at this. I will also say that when I was privileged to be the commander in Iraq and Afghanistan, all forces were under me, including those of our counterterrorism task force. Uh, and they adhered to the rules of engagement that we all adhered to. And we had very, very careful coordination uh, for that. Uh, in this case, they had carved out a separate area uh, that was under the control of those forces and was not under the oversight of the uh, overall commander. Something at the time that I pointed out, I thought uh, could have some uh, bad outcomes. Thank you. Do you have organizational design and organizational authorities? These are not trivial issues. Actually, uh, these are really very important. Yeah. And I've often pointed out that it took us nine years in Afghanistan to get that aspect of what we did correct. It took us nine years basically to get the inputs right in Afghanistan. We invaded in late 2001 after the 9-11 attack, September 11, 2001. Uh, and it was, again, nine years before we actually finally got all the different pieces in place that we should have had in place much sooner. And that included organizational architecture and the authorities and, and how the rules of engagement were overseen by the senior commander. Do you have time for one more question, General? Sure. Mm -hmm. Josefina. Just one moment. This is... Uh, This is Hari, uh, by the way. Uh, yes, General. You, uh... Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, tonight. I think that I have the most cryptic question for you. Uh, I'm not sure what the question actually is, uh, but let me elaborate on that. Um, I believe that the highest military uh, 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 order you have in the United States is the Medal of Honor. In the Netherlands, we have an equal uh, military honor, and that's called the uh, Military Royal Willems Order. And one of uh, the soldiers who received that military order has a question for you. He couldn't be here tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, he's called Marco Kroon, and he received um, uh, that military honor serving under you in Afghanistan. And apparently you know each other because his question to you is, is your watch still working on time? <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not sure what he meant with that. <laughs> I, I have an iPhone now. What he's really asking is your watch set five minutes ahead because of this old line that you know if you're if you're not early you're late. Um, and uh, but you know his actions were really quite legendary, and um, it, it was a privilege to have him and all the others. But but some individuals carried out such extraordinary actions, uh, frankly, that they are memorable. And that was a truly memorable one, and I, and I do remember him in, in that very well. And I thank him for the extraordinary service that he gave to, to his country, to the coalition, and to Afghanistan. Um, and again, I would just say, in, 
in closing, then, you know, an adage for life is that if you're not early, you're late. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, this <laughs> looks like the perfect question to end this session. Be mindful of your time. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us and, and maybe a little applause for the general for the remainder of his day. Thank you. Thank you well. Thank you very much. Not, not surprisingly, a lot of questions remain unanswered. So we will probably get back to you enough for another time. Uh, and and maybe we could, uh, yeah. So maybe we'll get back to you. But again, thank you very much for your time and um, have a great day. And uh, well, uh, we'll speak to each other at a later instance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye bye.